Hi class, this is Marcella again. Um, this is another lecture, and in this lecture we're going to be going over aspects of tree growth and how we measure how we measure tree growth, what is influenced by tree growth, and what does tree growth mean for silviculture and why it's important. So tree growth is influenced by numerous aspects. So we think of the physical side of it. So the site, the disturbances, the weather. So soils, moisture, temperature. They're also influenced by other plants. And we talked about this in a previous lecture, this idea of both positive and negative interactions. So competition and negative interactions, but we also have positive interactions like facilitation. So these aspects all influence tree growth. So why is tree growth important when we talk about ecology and silviculture? Well, especially when we talk about silviculture, one aspect of silviculture is understanding how trees grow and understanding how, how different silvicultural systems may influence growth of different species. So it's really important to kind of have this base of understanding of what goes into tree growth. So this very um, tree fizz background. So trees grow two ways. So we have primary and secondary growth. And primary growth is growth from the buds, root tips, and apical meristem. Whereas secondary growth is growth from the cambium, thickening of the stem, branches, and roots. So primary growth, we have growth going up and down. So um, the expansion um, both up from that shoot tip and the apical meristem and from the root apical meristem. So um, both up and down. Whereas with our secondary growth, we have this expansion of this increase in diameter. And this is a good figure to kind of review, kind of get that feeling for some of these terms again. Uh, apical meristem, shoot tip, root apical meristem. So just kind of look over this, jog your memory of these aspects of, of, of growth. And you can see we have, um, again, remember we have xylem and phloem. So good to remember these terms, all very important terms when we're talking about tree growth. So again, this is from a previous lecture. We talked about how trees allocate growth. So at the very basis, trees need to maintain. So this is the minimum. They need to do this maintenance. And if they don't do this, that means they're not able to survive. So trees need to first maintain. So they need the maintenance. Then they can go into the production of fine roots and leaves, flowers and seed productions, then we have height growth. So remember, height growth comes before diameter growth. So trees will allocate growth first to go up, so first in that primary growth compared to diameter growth, secondary growth, um, and tree resistance mechanisms. And this may move up if needed, so if in a stressful situation such as insects or disease or other aspects, tree resistance mechanisms may become more of a priority. So the crown shape, and crown shape really can tell us a lot about um, a tree's situation, and we'll kind of get into that in these next few, few slides. So crown shape can vary from, column, from a column to flat top. So it can be very variable, and that's based both on the situation, so the physical kind of that growth, so those growth interactions, whether it be the physical or um, the interactions between other plants. Um, our crown shape is also influenced by epinastic control. So what's epinastic control? So that's the tree's terminal bud controlling the length and orientation of lateral, lateral branches to different extents. So that's basically um, how much control that terminal bud has in different situations. So we think of weak and strong epinastic control. And it's really good to kind of get a picture. And um, as you're walking uh, around campus, these the 
weak versus strong epitastic control can be pretty visual when we talk about different tree species. So strong epinastic control has pretty predictable angles, length, um, length relative to the terminal snow. This is generally what we think of when we talk about conifers. So Douglas fir, trees fir, spruce, hemlock, yellow poplar, sweet gum, and red adler. Whereas weak epinaskin control, there can be multiple shoots as the central frame. So when we think about oaks and other hardwoods, so uh, very um, kind of branchy, um, broad, expansive compared to this very straight, uh, predictable growth. So, and we can describe this growth pattern as both as X current growth and D current growth. So X current growth, um, pretty um, straight, um, kind of like a cone, whereas D current growth, much more branchy, broad um, patterns. So what influences the shape? Well, it's influenced by a few things. Um, and one of them is side shade. So side shade is that shade that's cast by, um, by your competitors, by your species next to you. So except for that terminal shoot, except for that, um, that primary shoot, each branch must pull its own weight. So each branch must be photosynthesis, pho must have a positive photosynthesis balance. So this really determines crown length. Um, and we can see it in these two different pictures. So in this lower picture, we see these trees are pretty, pretty open, lots of sun. Um, and we can see a pretty low canopy when we're talking about these different species. And this, that crown length is really going to be dependent on a lot of different things, including the species. But we see these different branches are all getting enough photo enough sunlight to be photosynthesis, pho have a positive photosynthesis balance. So they're all contributing, they're all pulling their own weight. Whereas when we look at um, certain um, pine plantations or other species, we see this kind of expansion of the crown. So these branches aren't pulling their own weight. So they become the tree, um, they, be they die. So if they're not a positive impact to the tree, they become a sink and eventually um, the tree um, prunes them or they just become branches. So that whether the tree self prunes or whether the tree leaves those branches is really going to be dependent on the species and the situation. So we have this influence of side shade influencing our crown shape. So what else influences epinastic control? So um, we, we're talking about shade, so shade can come in to the side, and shade can also come through this idea of high shade. And high shade um, is when there's shade coming from a different canopy, a different crown position. So if we think about trees that are regenerating in the seedling or sapling, so small trees um, with an overstory, we, we can think about that as the amount of high shade. Um, so in full sunlight, we see this very kind of predictable pattern, especially when we have strong epinastic control, expansion of both the terminal and these lateral branches. Weak epinastic control in full sunlight, a little more kind of zigzaggy and everything, but generally when we have weak epinastic control in full sunlight, we still have the expansion of one terminal and these branches. Whereas when we have high shade, so again, um, some kind of reduction in light. So um, with an overstory, you have less light coming through. So we have this high shade. And we see that with strong epinastic control, we still um, maintain this one terminal. It can get a little flat topped, but once it's released, we still maintain that, that um, kind of shape. Whereas with epinastic weak epinastic control, we see a difference. So um, beneath high shade, it still gets flat topped, but we see two terminal um, leaders kind of coming out from here. And that influences those the shape of trees in the future. So that branching and forking and whatever um, is influenced by the level, 
of epinastic control, so that level of control in the terminal. So we see there's an influence of how different species um, are impacted by shade and just kind of this genetic background of whether they have weak or strong epinastic control. We also see that crown and tree development really depends on where you are in the canopy. So where you are in the canopy is based, we can kind of delineate these based on these different crown positions. So um, often we describe them in four or five different levels. So with we have dominant, so a main kind of canopy player, um, co-dominant, and these two are co-dominant, so kind of sharing that canopy. Intermediate, so kind of a little less, you're still getting good amount of sunlight from the top, um, but you're pretty well shaded from the side, whereas with co-dominant, you're probably getting sunlight from not only the top, but maybe a side or two, and suppressed. So those are the trees that probably aren't getting much sunlight from above, and we see we see this influence. So we see this influence on shape. So differences in a dominant tree versus co-dominant, uh, intermediate, and suppressed. So this influences um, where you are, what your crown looks like, um, and also your probability. What's your future? Um, how likely are you to survive? How likely, um, in a dominant case, okay, great, you're doing the maintenance um, you're meeting all this, so you're meeting that minimum growth requirement. You're meeting maintenance, um, and you're probably putting on new leaves, new roots, flowers and fruits, and height and diameter growth. Whereas the suppressed individual, it may be just meeting that minimum maintenance respiratory, or meeting that minimum maintenance. So it may not be able to allocate those other aspects to height and diameter. And that can influence its future, its ability to be in the stand. So um, crown and tree development, these are kind of broad categories, but they have the base in how, 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 much, um, how much trees have to allocate. And so these are four. So we have dominant, co-dominant, intermediate, and suppressed. And the fifth one um, that we often can use is open grown. So these are trees um, that haven't been, that have had the ability to kind of have free growth. So they have this unlimited, they have, um, when we talk about growing space, so they have this large amount of growing space to occupy. Whereas these individuals probably are competing for growing space. There's some kind of interaction going on between these individuals. And that's going to be variable on, um, based on where they are in the crown. So height growth. So height growth is one of those key components. So we saw um, after um, new leaves and new roots and after seed and fruit production comes height growth. So that's a pretty high priority. Trees need to grow tall to reach the sunlight and especially when they're competing with each other. So one way um, we can talk about height growth is um, looking at this idea of site index. And site index will define in a second, but as you can see, it's a measure of quality of a site. So um, on a poorer site, we see that there's a lower site index value at age 25. So site index looks at the impacts of age and height and gives you kind of this ability to judge quality. Um, so a poorer site index or a poorer site would have a lower site index, whereas a better site would have a bigger site index. So trees on a better site will, alloc will be able to grow taller um, than trees at a poorer site. So we're still all these trees are 25 years old, but we see the impact of the site on the growth, on, the, um, on our height. So 45 versus 75. So there can be a pretty big difference when we're talking about the impact of site 
on tree growth. So height growth, it follows this kind of sigmoidal curve um, in full sunlight. And um, any biometrician, any modeler will probably say this is a very simplified way of looking at height growth. And it is. So this is a very simplified um, way of looking at height growth. And then, again, crown size is proportional to tree height, especially with trees that have very strong epinastic control. So trees in, the conif in pines and conifers, um, those trees have pretty strong epinastic control. And we see um, crown size increases proportionally to height. And another key component is foliage. So the amount of foliage a tree is carrying is related to the total tree volume. And this idea of foliage and tree volume kind of should make sense. So um, for a tree to increase both in height and in volume, it has to have enough foliage. So it has to be photosynthesizing enough to meet all these different requirements. So the more foliage, the better foliage, um, should mean that it's able to meet a lot of requirements, including height and diameter growth, and allocate a lot of that growth to those aspects. So what is site index? So site index is a species-specific measure of actual or potential forest productivity. So again, getting at this idea of poor versus better site, good versus better, um, expressed as site quality, usually for even age stands. And we'll get um, into why this is usually for even age stands. And it's usually for even age stands. So even age stands, what are we thinking when we hear even age stands? So hopefully you're saying all trees within this kind of narrow range, about 20% of the rotation. Um, and okay, so we have a species specific measure of actual or potential forest productivity expressed in terms of the average height of trees, including in, included in a specified stand component. So this can be defined as a number of dominance or co dominance or the largest and tallest trees uh, per unit area. And site index is used as an indicator of site quality. So again, this is kind of, site index is a tool. So it's a tool that we can use um, when we're looking at systems to kind of judge the quality of a site. So, um, and site index may be used at a base age of 25, 50, or 100. And it will vary by region. So in the south, it's often trees grow a lot quicker. So often they use a base age of 25. Whereas in the lake states, um, we often use a base age of 50. So at 50 years, what is our site index? So that's kind of giving us this kind of base we want, we can kind of judge based on. So site index. So why do we look at height and not diameter? And what about what what about the dominant trees? Why are we using the dominant or tallest trees? And why might it be important just to focus on even age stands? Okay, so think about these questions. These are definitely potential quiz questions uh, for the next class. So why height and not diameter? What about dominant trees? So why height and not diameters? Well, think about the allocation of growth. We allocate growth to height before diameter. And also it's thought that height is pretty relatively independent of crowding. So height is um, more independent than diameter when we think about stand density. So um, a stand that is pretty dense or, or not as dense should have pretty similar height growths um, compared to diameter. What about dominant trees? Why are we looking at dominant trees? Well, we want 
to not look at suppression. So we want to look at this growth, how growth is influenced by the site, um, not how growth may be influenced by um, other characteristics like uh, other trees and overstory. So we don't want this, this tool works well in even age stands when they're, when they're not um, being impacted by suppression. So they're not um, having that decrease in growth potential. So here's an example of a site index curve uh, from um, the Lake State. So this is looking at red pine. So we have a few things going on here. So we have our total age in years. So how might we get our age of a tree? Probably get our age of the tree by coring. Or if you're in certain situations, you know when the trees were planted. So you know these trees were planted uh, 30 years ago. So that's something you know. Whereas the total height of the dominant and codominance that we can get by measuring um, with a chronometer, a laser hypsometer. So we have tools to measure height. And then this we can use to get our site index. And this is at base age 50. So if we look, if we have these two numbers, we have age and we have height. So an age of 40 and a height of 40. Take a moment and try to plot that out for yourself. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing a height of 40 and an age of 40. Okay. So what do you think our site index would be? Hopefully you're using your finger, your mouse, and you're following this curve to get a site index of 50. So we're seeing um, at this site, we have a site index of 50 if, we have, if the tree is 40 years old and 40 feet tall. Uh, what about age 50 and height 60? Where are we at? What's our site index? Give you a second to plot that. Great. Hope you, hopefully you put age 50, height 60, and followed those lines over. Okay, so what does that mean? What site index? So our site index would be 60 years old as we follow that line over here. So we have a site index of 60. What do we think our height would be at 80 years? So what do we predict if these, this stem, what do we predict will happen in the future? So at 80 years, we can predict that uh, our height will probably be just under, just under 85. So right around um, 83, 84, so just about 85 feet at 80 years. So that can give us some ability to plan some aspects. So um, add in... Um, in 30 years, we're going to expect another um, 25 feet of height growth. So this is just one tool. So site index is a tool kind of to look at, kind of give you some idea of site quality, where the stand may be moving, um, and this idea. So we look at a uh, site index of 60 versus uh, I think our other site index was 50. We can see the second example, we see that these trees are growing on a higher quality site. So um, there's something that's better, something that's 
better for these red pine, whether it's the soil, whether it's the moisture, whether it's this combination. But there's some kind of site aspect that allows that allows for better growth, um, has a higher site quality. And we can see that can have a huge influence when, between something at with a site index of 40 and something at a site index of 60 or 70. Um, so now kind of transitioning, let's talk about crown and tree development. So um, trees and crowns develop and these are important. These tell us a story. These tell us about what's going on at the site. And we see this example from Oliver and Larson. We see this expansion of both the terminal and the lateral branches. So crowns expand, terminal and lateral branches grow outward and upward. And this expansion changes a lot of aspects of the environment. So we see as this tree grows up and out, we see a difference in the light environment, in the moisture, in oxygen, in nutrient regime, regimes. So trees are influencing the as trees are influenced by their environment, but they also impact it as well. So there's these interactions that occur as trees grow. So, um, and these lower branches, again, remember, these lower branches have to have a positive photosynthesis impact. So they have to bring positive um, balance to the tree. And if they're not, um, the trees will prune them or leave them dead. So if they're not being positive, they're not an asset to the tree. So leaf area index. So this is one way we can look at, um, another way we can look at site quality, site productivity. Um, so leaf surface area of the canopy is greater than the ground area. So um, the amount of area that's composed of leaves is going to be greater than the area that these leaves kind of compose are 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 over. So why why might that happen? So why if we thought if we think about this, if we take a square and we have so if we take if we take this square, right? We have a square And we have um, a tree. So here's this tree, and we'll use this example. So it has this crown that covers it, right? So the crown covers all this. Crown covers that square area. But why, why is this crown surface area, why is the leaf surface area of the canopy greater than this area of the ground that it's covering? Why? Why might, why don't they fit together? Well, leaves overlap. So you don't just have one layer of leaves in your canopy. They're overlapping. Um, there's multiple layers. There's not just one, one area that covers that square. And that's where we get at this idea of leaf area index. So leaf area index, or LAI for short, is the ratio of leaf area to ground area cover. And this, this is just kind of a straight number. So um, think of Norway spruce. Think of a really dense spruce, um, spruce or fir or some conifer that just has tons of needles. We can, that conifer is going to have a larger LAI. So there's an example. So Norway spruce has an LAI of 12. So that means in that little square we were talking about, in this square, the amount of leaves is 12 times that ground area. So there's 12 times, there's 12 squares of leaves that are composed from Norway pine. Whereas oaks, there's a lot more light that generally gets through oaks, not as dense amount of foliage. So they have a lower leaf area index but we're still talking about a leaf area index of three. So there's three, um, three squares of oak leaves for every area of ground it covers. So this is one way to kind of think about um, 
kind of what's on our site, what, how much is on our site, how, how productive our site is. And this is really going to vary by, by species, by region. So um, it's good when we're talking about LAI to kind of get a range for what we're talking about, to kind of calibrate our, 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 our range for that system. So getting back, tree growth. So we have this increase in crowns and roots and stems, and we've looked at how both the site influences and what we can kind of have some measures. So we have measures of um, site index, leaf area index. These are measures that we can kind of look at. We see, we've talked about how trees allocate their growth, um, and we've talked about what influences that growth. So the site. Um, and in a previous lecture, we talked about this idea of growing space, growing factors, what trees need. Um, so tree growth. So we have, so kind of trying to tie this all together. We have this increase in crowns. We have roots. We have stems. When, when do we fully occupy this growing space? When, when, what, what can we key on and, and say, oh man, I think, I think our growing space is occupied. I think we're at that level. So one, one thing we can kind of clue into is when crowns start touching. And that we can call crown closure. So when we have these crowns interacting. So this is a red pine logging site. So we see before, we see that these crowns were interacting, they were touching. Um, the site was probably fully occupied. We had a full occupancy of growing space. Uh, the growing space was fully occupied. We had a harvest. We were changing the site. And now, with the reduction of overstory basal area, there's growing space available. And these trees can use that growing space and there's also probably going to be this idea to regenerate, to get new individuals, new red pine, um, taking up that newly, that available growing space. So crown closure is one way we can think about when trees are fully occupying a site. So um, what, when may trees be fully, what, what aspect may be limiting? So in here we see there's, there's probably a few things that may be limiting um, when we talk about um, tree growth. Uh, so tree growth may be limited by light in this case. So they're using, all these trees are using all the available light. So they've reached, their canopies have closed, they're using all the light. So light might be one limiting resource that may influence this, that may um, influence growing space. Can growing space be fully occupied without crown closure? What may cause, what, what may cause that limitation um, if we had more of an open stand that may be using all its growing space? So moisture may limit those situations. So there may be situations where trees are fully occupying the site. All the growing space is used, but the crowns aren't touching. And it may be because the site is so limited in moisture, it doesn't support a full, fully closed canopy. And kind of think back, think, um, think of some examples of where you might see this. And that may include um, some Western... Um, kind of these pinion juniper, these very low, dry sites. So when we talk about tree growth, um, and we talk about this use of uh, how trees grow and how different um, aspects interact, interact growth, we can think about trees growing as hitting this wall. And this wall, um, in this case, is a very literal wall that's a black line. Um, but in other cases, we can think of this wall as other trees, other individuals, um, both maybe of the same species or different species. So we see at um, this first age, it's free to grow. It has more than enough available growing space. But as we see um, 
by age B, we see the trees starting to get limited, and we see this change in how um, how how it's allocating its foliage. So we see these lower these lower limbs are not pulling their weight, and we see that influences that influences its growth in the future and how our crown looks. And so this, how a crown looks, it's um, what it looks like can tell us about the level of competition, what's going on in the stand, what is the site like, um, what, how are these trees growing, and it tells us a lot about it just by looking at it, just by, if we saw this, we could tell a lot that this tree was pretty, there's a lot of competition, um, we see, um, that these lower stems, there had to be something blocking that. There had to be a good amount of trees, high density stand, because we see very low um, canopy. We see a lot, very low canopy compared to its total height. So crown crozier, that's that, that's when it hits the wall. Um, and this is where trees either reach that wall, so in this case they reach this black line, or they, in in most other environments, they hit hit the other trees. And this influences the lower branches, it influences the environment below, and we see this influences its growth rate. We see um, trees are going to continue, we, we talked about this maintenance, we talked about this allocation of growth resources. So they need to do maintenance, they need to do these other things. Um, but if there's only so much photosynthesis, you're going to allocate these these in certain ways, and you're not going to be able to maybe grow as tall be, or grow as wide. So you're not going to be able to allocate as much to height and diameter growth. And we, these lower branches, we see less and less photosynthesis, and these may um, be slight drains before they die. So the tree has to cut these off if they're not a positive, if they're not bringing more photosynthesis than it uses. So if it's not um, increasing the photosynthesis, if it's being a drain. So growth and um, growing space. And we see um, in certain situations when a tree has such limited growing space, all that energy may go to maintenance. And this is where we can get these really flat crowns and this idea of stagnation. So um, stagnation is um, this concept that if all else is equal on a site, the stand will stall. So if all these trees are interacting in the exact same way and all the energy is going just to maintenance, the stand's going to stall. So it's not going to be able to go anywhere. How, how common do you think this is? When is everything else equal? No, so quite, site quality is going to vary, even just slightly, genetic quality. So eventually, so eventually, even if it's super dense, even if these are all the same species, a few trees will, with better genes or on better sites will have some kind of advantage and slowly outcompete. It's a very slow, slow process. Um, but we often don't see true stagnation. So we've been talking about growth. We've been talking about tree growth. What can this crown tell us? So the crown can tell us a lot about the site, about the conditions. It can give us this kind of, it's almost like a detective. We can see a lot of stuff by just looking at the crown. We have height as a higher priority than diameter. And we have competition resources that can influence the crown. And we can calculate the crown ratio. And this can, be, this can give us an index of tree vigor. And the crown ratio is this ratio of the live crown to our total height. So a live crown ratio, so we have a live crown of 50 feet 
and our total height of 80 feet. And this gives us a live crown ratio of about 63 or 63%. And generally, we want this live crown ratio to be greater than 30%. So in this case, if we look at instead of 50 feet, what if the live crown ratio was only 30 feet? What would the live crown ratio be? So live crown ratio would probably be about 38%. So instead of 50 over 80, we would have um, 30 over 80. So 30 divided by 80 equals 0.375 or about 30%, 38%. And what does that, what can we tell? What, what can we tell? We can tell there's probably more competition for resources and less growing space for this individual. So why, why do trees die? <laughs> and this is, <laughs> this is a very broad question. But when, think about this. Think about what we've been talking about. We've been talking about tree growth. We've been talking about all these ideas. So why do trees die? So as the tree grows, the respiring tissue increases, and unless the photosynth photosynthetic surface area also increases, the tree will eventually starve. So we see, we see this level of how trees allocate growth. So trees need to do this minimum maintenance. So they need to have this minimum photosynthetic area to support the tree, to do this minimum amount. And if it's just doing this minimum amount, we often see these trees are often extremely weak. And this is where they're attacked by insects or diseases or whatnot. Um, so why trees die really comes back to this idea of what they have, what they have to allocate, how much, how much of that growing space do they have and how they can use it. Um, so this idea of how they can use it, um, we can look at it as this release. So trees need to maintain this photosynthetic area. And we have this, this example of a tree as it's released. So we have a tree at age A, and we can see as it's growing, it's hitting, it's hitting that wall, it's hitting crown closure, it's interacting. And we see that influences um, that influences the crown that will influence the growth. Um, but we can see if if it's released, if there's some kind of change in the environment, we can see that trees are very flexible. They can adapt, um, and we see that compared to age E, we see G. There's this. There's this release from the shade. We see this expansion of the canopy, and we see this increase in photosynthetic area, which may increase both all these other things, height, diameter, all these things. So how trees grow and how trees allocate growth, this is key to our understanding of how we do different management techniques, how we manage our forests, and how disturbance, how natural, how man-made disturbance influences our trees, influences what's here. So this release, we have this retention of a live crown. Um, if, if a tree is too tall, if it's too, if it's allocated so much of that growth to height and not to diameter, it can be pretty wobbly. It can buckle or topple over. And we can also have this idea have this impact of sun skull. So heat can t kill the newly exposed cambrium. But we have this increase in growth. We have this increase in photosynthetic area. We have this increase in the amount that the tree can allocate. And that is the end of this lecture. <laughs>